this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Hot on the heels of victory in Sicily, the Allies crossed into southern Italy in September 1943. They expected to drive the Axis forces north and be in Rome by Christmas. And although Italy surrendered, the German forces resisted fiercely and the swift, hoped-for victory descended into one of the most brutal battles of the war. Joining me today is James Holland, author of The Savage Storm, The Battle for Italy 1943 and co-host of the We Have Ways podcast. So, James, welcome. Um, My starting point is Husky, I think, um, the invasion of Sicily in July 43. I wondered, had the Allies always anticipated Sicily being um, a stepping stone with Italy as the ultimate objective? Or was there an element of we've got this, well, we might as well carry on? Yeah, it's very much the latter, really. So grand strategy is, is, is sort of evolving in the first half of 1943. And the decision to go to Sicily following victory in Tunisia, which at the time of the decision is made is is absolutely not been achieved. This is agreed in January 1943 at the Casablanca Conference, which is just the Western Allies. So this is, you know, Roosevelt, Churchill and all the chiefs of staff. And that's where they decide that it would be a good idea to go into, in, into Sicily, primarily to get a toehold in, in, in Europe, but also to try and knock Italy out of the war. That's the key thing. And then, you know, the advantages of knocking Italy out of the war are, are twofold. One, you, there's one less enemy to worry about. But secondly, there's a large swathe of the southern Mediterranean, which is occupied by Italian troops. And so Germany would then be faced with a dilemma. It would either have to have to abandon those territories or fill them with their own troops. But, you know, troops don't grow on trees and, and, you know, they'd have to come from the Eastern Front and elsewhere. And also, more importantly, the Western Front. And it is the Western Front, the cross-channel invasion, Operation Overlord, as it gets called in May 1943 at the Trident Conference, which is the next major conference in Washington. That is where Overlord is kind of sort of given its stamp. And, and right, no more mucking about. We've been we've been faffing around, kind of talking about this, but no we're actually pinning it down. Right now, let's pin it down. This becomes the number one priority in the West from now on. Now, obviously, it takes time. It's agreed that it, it's not something that we can do, that they can do in 1943. So it, in May 1943, at the Trident Conference, it is set... Operation Overlord, the cross-channel invasion, which later becomes the 6th of June, 1944, is set in 1943 on the 1st of May, 1944. And that is the priority. There is discussion about Italy, but nothing is agreed. So the idea is that that what they'll do is maybe go into Italy, let's see what happens with Sicily, let's see how it all pans out, see what our situation is in the summer and, and, and take it from there. And so the Italian campaign is one that is really, really evolving. And Churchill is very, very keen to push into Italy and to take Rome, which he sees as a kind of sort of massive psychological um, victory as well as an actual victory. And Churchill, with his kind of nod to history and everything, obviously, you know, Rome is Rome. And so, you know, it's a kind of sort of, as far as he's concerned, it's sort of up there with Paris as 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 a kind of sort of, you know, most eminent capital city in Europe and all the rest of it. So there's sort of big psychological reasons for doing it. But interestingly, it's the Americans who are initially wary about this because they're worried that Italy is going to suck in lots of resources from from potentially Overlord and elsewhere, who are a bit, bit, bit worried about it. But actually, they come round to the idea because they appreciate that an invasion of Italy could help Overlord, set for the 1st of May 1944 at this point. But more importantly, they're really worried about air power, and they're really worried about not having a huge swathe of control of the skies over northwest Europe in time for for Normandy. That may seem sort of completely removed from a decision about Italy, but it really isn't. And the reason you 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 want to have a swathe of air superiority over the whole of Northwest Europe rather than just the invasion beaches of Normandy is because the moment you land on Normandy, the cat is out of the bag, 
And then it's a race to who, which side can build up decisive amounts of forces quickest. Is it going to be the Allies who have got, oh, will have by that stage overwhelming material superiority in Britain, but who have to ship it across the channel? Or will it be the Germans who are already on the continent? And the way you slow down the Germans on the continent and make sure that it is Britain and, and uh, allies, America and Canada and all the rest of it, that are able to build up um, uh, material quickest is by slowing down the German speed of getting to Normandy. And you do that by blowing up bridges and blowing up marshalling yards, railway yard, and railway lines, and locomotives and all the rest of it. And you do that by bombing at very low level. But you can only do that if you don't have fucking wolves and Messerschmitts hovering above you. So how do you get around this? How do you get around this problem of of, of clearing that, that space? Because ironically, on the very same day that Sicily is in Allied hands, the 17th of August 1943, is also the same day that the Americans of the 8th Air Force, operating from Britain, launched a Schweinfurt Regensburg raid. And it's a catastrophe because they lose 60 of their 315 heavy bombers and something like 128 are damaged. And it's an absolute disaster. And this is a rate of losses that you know, even America just can't even hope to, to maintain. And, and, and the reason they did, did they launched the Schweinfurt Regensburg raid is because although the Ruhr industrial complex heartland of Germany is very conveniently placed in the western half of Germany, most of the aircraft industry is in the south. It's in southern Bavaria and Austria and all the rest of it. They haven't got a fighter plane that can escort the heavy bombers all the way from Britain to, say, Regensburg, Schweinfurt, Wiener, Neustadt, whatever it might be, um, Augsburg, from England. But in Italy, <laughs> so fine, I'm getting to the point. In Italy, two fifths of the way up the uh, up the leg on the Adriatic side, there is a very rare bit of flat ground um, uh, centered around a, a town called Foggia, and around there is the opportunity for oodles of of airfields where you can house heavy four-engine bombers from where you can get to Wiener Neustadt and Augsburg a little bit easier than you can from England and from which you can further tighten the noose. And so it is this above everything else that persuades the Allied Chiefs of Staff and particularly the Americans that some kind of venture in Italy would be worthwhile. But, which is interesting because if you look at it from the German perspective who are then looking, are the Allies going to invade Italy, what they're going to do? You have Rommel going, well, we'll just abandon the South, at which point he cedes that control of the air. And you've got Kessering, who actually I guess is an air, air commander, although you know, I appreciate he was originally artillery and then he moves into the Air Force, wanting to hold the south so you've got that weird kind of what we're going to do who's do we hold everything do we hold how how does that play out from the german point of view when they're arguing because of course it's rome as well that you know rommel's essentially saying well rome we're not interested in the pr idea of rome well i i think rommel is right if you accept that you're going to abandon the fodger airfields because because with something like fodger airfields you've got the plus one minus one factor you've got the benefit of being able to use them yourselves but you've also got the benefit of denying them to the enemy and the converse is true of course so if you if you're going to defend the south that's fine but you've got to make sure that you hold on to fodger because otherwise there's no point rommel's point is we don't have the troops to hold successfully or conveniently or easily the whole of the Balkans, the whole of the Aegean, and the whole of Italy all in one go. And we'd be much better to cut our losses and really defend the north with more fighter bases in the north should strategic bombers be, be put into southern Italy. Then we can shorten our lines of supply because I faced the British and the Americans and I know what their air power is like. And the longer the lines of supply we have, particularly in a mountainous country like Italy, the harder our life is going to be. And he's absolutely unquestionably got a point. But Kessering's point is, no, 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 no. We can, we can, we can defend against this. We can defend the whole of Italy against this. And the matter is not settled at all by the time of the invasion uh, and by the time the, the uh, Italian surrender is subsequently signed because – also on the 17th of August, not only is it the first day, the, the day that Sicily falls into Allied hands, and not only is it the, the date of the um, Schweinfurt um, Regensburg raid, it is also the day that the negotiations face to face begin between the Italians and the Allies, albeit in Lisbon, I think it is. So lots is going on. So, they, so the Allies have, uh, you know, one of the reasons for going into Italy is get to hurry Italy out of the war. Well, that that's already kind of sort of, you know, looking looking a dead cert. 
So that then means that, that Germany is going to have to draw troops into, into the Balkans and all the rest of it. So, you know, Hitler knows this, Rommel knows this, Kesselring knows this. And, and they've been building up troops. And their, their, their number one priority in late August, beginning of, of September, is how they're going to disarm the Italian armed forces and use all of those as slave labor and then occupy those territories themselves. So that's their kind of sort of number one, one plan. And it is absolutely the case that, that although it hasn't been quite sorted, Hitler at the end of August, beginning of September, is favouring the Rommel approach. And his intention, as September 1943 dawns, is to retreat to the Pisa-Rimini line the moment Allied troops land in Italy. And the Pisa-Rimini line is you know, 200 miles north of Rome and, and runs from the Tyrrhenian Sea on the west to the Adriatic, you know, to Rimini on the Adriatic coast and the east which would have made the entire Italian campaign a very, very different proposition, it has to be said. Makes you wonder if they really saw that allied threat of taking the airfields at Foggia, if they, it wasn't something that was in their field of vision. Intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think it was. There's just no discussion of Foggia at all. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't find. I'm not saying there, there wasn't, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist. All I'm saying is I never found it. Uh, and there's quite a lot of, of transcripts of Hitler conferences and stuff like that. It's just, it's just, it's just not mentioned. It's just bizarre. I, and I think the reason it's not mentioned is because the plan is to retreat to the Piers Rimini line and how they're going to combat any potential Allied air forces in the southern half of Italy is by concentrating more fighters in the north to defend those skies. I think that's, that's the plan. So from the Allied perspective, when it comes to the invasion, Who's driving it? Why do they sort of go for Salerno and and and, and the and the hail? Why not just go straight straight for Rome? Well, because Kesselring expects straight for Rome, doesn't he? He expects them to be yeah, yeah. And I find that bizarre, but because as an airman, I don't understand how he could possibly think that that could work. You you simply cannot do an amphibious assault without control of the skies. You know that is just an absolute prerequisite and weirdly even hitler recognizes that when he's sort of thinking about operation sea lion the invasion of britain back in the autumn of 1940 you know he recognizes that destroying the RAF is absolutely kind of non-negotiable event that has to have happened before you can even consider launching sea lion so even he who is not known for his prescient views on military strategy gets that and the problem is is that rome is too far north and it's really weird because the Italians are expecting an invasion at Rome and the Germans are kind of sort of half thinking that might be a, an option as well. But how they're going to do, how the Allies are supposed to do this is anyone's guess because it's beyond fighter range from, from, from Sicily and from Malta and from, from Northwest Africa. So that is the constraint. In actual fact, they, you know, what, what Mark Clark, who ends up, who's commanding Fifth Army, which is the main evasion event, which subsequently happens on the 9th of September, Operation Avalanche. He wants to land in that flat area just north of Naples. But again, it is considered that, yes, it is just about within the realms of fighter range. The amount of time they'd be able to spend over the, over the invasion front, over the bridgehead, would be so short before they had to go back that it was kind of it was better to sacrifice a little bit of coast mileage uh, and go a little bit further south and land, uh, and, and land in that area south of Salerno, between Salerno and uh, Agropoli, a sort of thirty mile coastal stretch. That's where they should land instead. In my in my head, I knew I know what Italy looks like. G- 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 the geography, and actually reading the book, I then went and got the. Port, I think Google has a topographical map, and I was thinking, well, where would? You, oh, well, you are limited, aren't you? If you wanted to get a lot of, and it, 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 it's hardly surprising, sort of where they the decisions that they come to, but at the same time, Matt Clark does almost come unstuck at uh, Avalanche, doesn't he? Why is that? I don't think it's as close as as, as it appears in the telling, or it uh, seemed actually at the time. Mark Clark is given a really, really tough hand. There's no question about it. And, and the constraint of, of the operations in Italy are all down to shipping, specifically assault craft, because unless you've got a port, if you've got a port, it's fine, because you can just sail in and moor, you know, moor your ship up against the quayside and off you and disembark. And obviously, the bigger the vessel, the more you can unload at one time. So there's sort of economies of scale of it. The problem is if you don't have a port, you've got to land on a beach. And landing on a beach requires landing craft or assault craft. And therein lies the rub, because although both British and particularly American shipyards have been building gargantuan amounts of assault craft, it's still not enough for the kind of global 
demands that the Allies have given themselves. Uh, and one of the other factors that emerges in the Trident Conference of May 1943 is the American desire to accelerate the war against Japan in the Pacific. And of course, being the Pacific and there being lots of islands and lots of atolls and all the rest of it, huge amounts of shipping is required. So there's a conflict of interest here. Um, and there, there's a question of prioritizing. And if you've already prioritized Overlord, then you prior, you know, then next on the list is, 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 um, the Pacific War. And, you're also supplying the Chinese nationalists and you're also supplying the Soviet Union and you're also supplying Southeast Asia. You've got a lot that you're supplying and you've got a lot of challenges and there just isn't the shipping to do everything you want. So it's really interesting because when you think about Operation Husky, which is the invasion of Sicily on the 10th of July, 1943, the Allies could amass 1,743 landing craft of various types. But for Operation Baytown, which is the initial very small little probe across the Straits of Messina in the very toe of Sicily, just two divisions of of Eighth Army. And I should say, for those who don't know, that a division is the unit by which we judge the scale of armies in the Second World War. And if you're thinking about 15,000 men, give or take, you're not far off it. But each of those divisions requires 3,000 different vehicles, for example. You know, and they've all got to be maintained. So they've only got 368 assault craft for that. And for Avalanche, the, the um, Mark Clark's invasion of Fifth Army at, at, at Salerno, only got 359. 359 assault craft is really not enough. That 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 is enough to land three divisions, have another float four floating division, and land some special forces, the commandos and the US Army Rangers, who can go and secure some mountain passes north of Salerno on the way to way to, to Naples. And that's it. And and if you think again that Sicily, 160,000 people landed in the first 24 hours. It's a totally different kettle of fish, you know, 242 warships or something like that for, for, for Sicily, possibly about 71 for, for Avalanche. And in Sicily, there were just two German divisions at the time, and they weren't even manning the coast. They were in the interior. Whereas for Avalanche, there are 19 German divisions operating in Italy at that particular time. Now, admittedly, there's only one directly opposite them at Salerno, but obviously, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that in pretty quick order, a large number of those are going to be alongside them. They're going to be suddenly shuffled down to, to Salerno in pretty quick order. And if and if they're not quick, and if they don't get a foothold on a firm foothold on land really, really quickly, and follow up with more troops really, really quickly, they're going to get shoved back into the sea. And that's a dilemma for Mark Clark. And the problem with Mark Clark is, is that, you know, he hasn't commanded troops in battle since 1918. So that's not his fault. That's because he's American. You know, it's just the way the cookie crumbles. But but he's an incredibly experienced commander and planner and, and, and a brilliant operator and operational commander. But he's just untested. And he's got this really, really hard hand that he's been given. The amazing thing is, is he pulls it off. Uh, but what is really interesting is, is there's this – Famous counter of infamous counterattack, depending on which way you look at it. Because so what happens is is Rome is captured on the afternoon of of the tenth of of September by German forces against an Italian uprising, which then means that Kesselring can divert as many of his troops of his his eight divisions that he has in his sphere of Army Group C in the south. He can direct them all to to to, to Salerno, and in fact, actually, he directs six and elements of a seventh. So he leaves one division in Rome, but all the rest are sent to Salerno. You know, down in the southeast, the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division is told to disengage from 8th Army. And even units from the 1st Fauschenjäger Division, the 1st Paratroop Division, are filtered off towards Salerno. And they are protecting the whole of the southeast of Italy, that area of Apulia, which includes Taranto, Brindisi, Bari, those crucial ports, but also, crucially, Foggia as well. And so you've got a uh, not full strength and also uh, division, which is where, where units are also being filtered off to go to Salerno. And the bulk of these forces are in place by the 13th of September, so four days after Clark's invasion, after Fifth Army's invasion. And they launch a series of um, armoured counterattacks. But the biggest one peaks at around a mile from where Clark's headquarters is. Uh, just right next to the Sele River, which is this river that runs down and kind of sort of bisects the two halves of the invasion front. And 
it looks incredibly frightening and it must have been incredibly alarming at the time. And you can see, God, they were so close. They were so close. But actually, when you walk the ground, what you can see is the problem that the Germans have is they've gone into a kind of V-shaped bit of terrain where where another river joins the the uh, the river Sele. The Calore reaches the Sele. And the Germans obviously assumed that they could ford it there because it's September. It's after a long summer. The water's going to be low, et cetera. That's the thinking. What they hadn't appreciated was that the banks of these rivers are really, really steep and completely unfordable and much too wide to board. And they just, and they don't have the bridging equipment. And American gunners are able to pour fire onto them from slightly higher ground. And because they're field guns rather than anti-tank guns, they're lobbing shells rather than firing directly at high velocity, which is what an anti-tank gun does. And so they're lobbing, you know, best part of 4,000 shells into this tiny little triangle of land. And the Germans have got nowhere to go. So although they were geographically very close to the coast and to Clark's headquarters, they might as well have been 50 miles away for all the good it was going to do them. And so the German counterattack is ultimately a, a terrible failure and a great triumph for Clark and his forces because they prevail. That they're able to get more 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 troops in, they're able to kind of build up strength and win that particular battle. And on the morning of the seventeenth of September, Kessering has to order his his forces to retreat. But his plan had been to for chuck everything, throw all his eggs in one basket, chuck everything at the Salerno invasion, kick that into touch, then turn back and deal with Eighth Army and clear the whole of southern Italy again and hold it. But while his back was turned dealing with Salerno, the British landed the first um, airborne division at Taranto. And there was no, there weren't, there just weren't enough troops, German troops in the area to defend it. So they just walked straight in. And by the 27th of September, Foggy was in Allied hands because the Fauschenjäger division that were defending the southeast, they only had enough strength to be able to kind of sort of blur a few bridges and do a few demolitions and not much more and a few rear guards. And that was it. And that wasn't enough. So so it was a catastrophic failure by, by Kessering and his commander. You, you make that sound much more exciting, the, that British landing. The, 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 I have a quote from Wikipedia because it amused me so much. The 8th Army marched 300 miles north to Salerno uh, against no opposition other than e- engineering obstacles, which just made it, makes it sound like a few trees were blown up or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the, the fashion were very, very adept laying charges and IEDs as we'd call them now and um, blowing bridges and stuff so you know it held them up a little bit but but they couldn't offer more opposition than that and so you know one division for the whole of southeast east Italy is just not enough and it wasn't even a full strength division at that and of course the whole thing about fashion Jaeger is they're, they're very they're heavily armed with small arms you know machine guns rifles um, submachine guns that sort of stuff but they're, they're not heavily equipped with other armaments guns you know anti-tank guns and all that kind of stuff so you know, there's a there's the shortcomings to the the, the organisational structure of the Fauschenjäger division, the paratrooper division, and they just don't have the weight of of fire to be able to do more than a few delaying actions. So they capture Foggia. I think it takes about three weeks or something. Is there an a, a element of mission creep now? So if you justify the airfields of capturing your airspace, the Allies have them. But a, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, talk about the Battle of Cannae in the ancient world. Points out that if you're moving forward, you're winning. Is there an element now where the Allies think, "Well, we've got this far. Do we need to just keep up the pressure and, and move on?" You know, who's driving that thinking? If that's what they are thinking. So, so at the beginning of October, Alexander, who's the uh, army group, the, the Allied army group commander, um, General Sir Harold Alexander, he pens his thoughts and, and does briefings and stuff. And his thinking, his point is. Yeah, it's great because by the 1st of October, you know, we've won Naples. We've got Naples is in our hand. You know, Italy is out of the war. That's a tick. We've drawn off lots of German troops. Tick. We've got Foggia. Tick. You know, so that's three out of the four objectives, which is the fourth objective being Rome. And by this point, it was raining, by the way, and raining really heavily. The problem is, he said, now we've got Foggia. We've got to make sure we don't lose Foggia. And once you're in on something and you're engaging with the enemy, you have to maintain the initiative. And about which he's absolutely correct. You can't suddenly sort of go, okay, we'll draw a line now and be on the defensive. There's no point investing all that shipping time, energy, effort, getting Foggia there if six weeks later the Germans counterattack and take it back again. So in other words, what you need is you need to kind of press far enough forward north to make sure that Foggia isn't threatened. So having got it, you've got to hold on to it. And that means 50 miles north of Rome by his estimation. And it's really, really hard to disagree with him. That does sound about right. 
uh, and he's got a point. And and this is this is the issue. And 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 the the big failing of the Italian campaign is is not the ground commanders. It's not their appreciations of the situation as it unfolds. It's not their how they deal with fifty percent of of the time it raining. Um, it the, the the constraints are doing this in winter without sufficient material support. And that goes back to this same old thing of shipping. You know, they launch it without enough shipping and get away with it, but they're maintaining it with not enough shipping. And something has to give. And, and what gives is speed, <laughs> you know, speed of advancement. Well, I think the other thing that they're facing is an incredible hostile environment they're fighting in. It's a very difficult environment that favours the defender. Really difficult. And of course, and of course the, the, the weakness of the narrowness of the Italian peninsula is that you can easily outflank it if you have the shipping. <laughs> but the Allies don't have the shipping because they, their shipping is now being repaired in, and being used for training in, in England and in the Pacific. And, and it's, it's an interesting point I think it's worth making about landing craft and assault craft is that these things take incredible punishment. And some only a couple of months ago, I was in a Higgins boat. And it's so basic. It's so simple. You know, they're, they're very quickly made and cobbled together and sort of bish, bash, bosh, and sort of, you know, welded and bolted, and there you are, you're good to go. But, but again, that comes at a price. And the, and the price is these things get damaged very easily. Because if you think about it, you know, it's not just about landing troops on D-Day. It's about maintaining the effort throughout any campaign, because you can't be guaranteed to have ports open the whole time. So you need to keep these landing craft going. I mean, the landing craft are used for, for Sicily. We used every single day of the campaign, the 38 days of the campaign. And if you think about it, every time a, a landing craft lands, it's landing by hitting the shore. That has structural wear and tear, just that process. And so what happens is after a while, landing craft have to be taken out of service and overhauled. You know, have to be taken down to Malta or to, I don't know, Alexandria or, or or Algiers or Iran or any of these places in Europe and, and repaired and, and overhauled and then put back into action again. And, and this is why there is such a shortage for the Italian campaign, because you're having the repair process. Then you're having a whole load taken back to Britain. Then you're having a whole load more going over to the Pacific. You know, so it's a process and a half. And, and you know, Shipping takes a long time and, and has to be prepared a long time in advance, and, and shipping scales have to be worked out a long time in advance. So if you suddenly need to kind of go, oh, my, my campaign in Italy isn't going quite long according to plan, can we change the shipping schedules? It's like, well, not very easily <laughs> because they're being used elsewhere by this point, and that's, therein lies the rub. You put that very well because it's a it, it, slightly ro wrong campaign. I'm fairly sure that if you look at the figures for the Royal Army Service Corps, they make a point that the landing craft land more supplies in Normandy than the Mulberry Harbours do. And this just the weight weight of going backwards. I mean, they're, doing, they're, they're landing different things. I appreciate that. But if you're looking at sheer... Wait. They do, but they have they have the, the, the principles of the, the the main principle of the of the of the Marbury Harbour is the Gooseberry, you know, which is these sort of sunken ships which break water. So off Utah, off Omaha, off Gold Sword and Juno, they have these Gooseberries as well, which enables them to land more. It was one of those facts that my dad pointed out to me after I'd, I'd given him the uh, the history of the Royal Army Service Corps because at, at one point he should have been on ducks. At Mulberry, but he apparently his story is he had oh, I don't know tonsillitis and then got put back and ended up on lorries rather than ducks, which pleased him because he couldn't swim in hated water. Yeah, <laughs> but if you think about it, the um, you know you've got five beaches, um, you've only got one Mulberry, so it's it's not really surprising that overall it's more. The point, I mean, one should never belittle one should never belittle the importance of the Mulberry, but but the the the, the ingenious of it uh, of the whole thing is that that you are able to land a vast amount of material just through these assault craft and landing craft. Um, and, and the most precious of all are the landing ships, which are in many cases longer than a destroyer, you know, that's sort of 120 metres long. You know, they're vast and they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they have a covered deck and all the rest of it. So so they're, 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 they're big vessels and they can literally just go straight onto the beach. I mean, it's just draft or something like four for eight. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're incredible pieces of kit. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. I'm joined by James Holland and we are discussing the Battle for Italy in 1943. 
So from the from the, if you look look at this from Kesselring's perspective, he's he's now fighting in the south, which you know he's kind of I guess won that back. But why is he allowed to withdraw to a, create a line in the sand? Because you know, traditionally, uh, you know, if you look at Russia, Hitler's going no, no, we, we're not conceding any land. Stand a fight, counterattack, counterattack. But he's allowed to withdraw to the to to his. Gustav line. I think it's the it's a, it becomes a series of lines, doesn't it? Well, so well, well, Hitler is furious at the loss of, of Fodger, and they've all realised a bit too late the importance of this. But you know, it's like shutting the door after the horse has bolted. But Hitler, because Hitler's Hitler, has been impressed by Kesselring's stout defence of Salerno. So he's he's drawn completely the wrong lessons from 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 Salerno. So rather than seeing it for the failure that it is, the absolute abject failure of strategy and and an operation and tactics that the that, that, that the German counterattack at Salerno is. Hitler goes, oh, actually, they kind of nearly gave the Americans bloody nose and, and the Allies bloody nose. Actually, I don't want to retreat to the Pisa Rimini line after all. I'm going to stay south. But 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 he still hasn't quite 100 percent decided until kind of, sort of late October. And so Kesselring is told to just sort of carry on fighting and holding up the Germans from, um, um, south of Rome. And it's not until later on in October that, that Rommel is packed off to Command Army Group B in Normandy instead. First was an inspection tour, and then Army Group B gets moved over, and I think in sort of early January 19, 1944. So Kesselring is is sort of still in control of things when he re- draws to the Volturno line, which is about 25 miles north of, of Naples, and recognising that that is the next next sort of holding point. Kesselring's idea is to kind of hold the Allies to a certain point while he is building up a kind of double lock, super duper defensive situation, defensive line. First the Bernhard line, then the Gustav line, which are only about kind of eight miles apart, across the width of of of, of Italy, of which the strongest point is is around the Mignano Gap and then subsequently around Casino. And this is about sort of eighty and seventy miles south of Rome. His instructions from Hitler are. Defend Rome, defend south of Rome to the last man. And the problem is, is that now that, that Kesselring has won the kind of the, the battle with for influence over Rommel, he's now got the Hitlerian spotlight on him. And, you know, that's enough to make any German commander quake. The last thing you want is Hitler kind of watching your every move and insisting that you don't give up a yard and that you don't withdraw and all the rest of it. Because that's really, really hampering Kesselring's room for maneuver. And the truth is, they, you know, he, it's completely pointless. There's, there's, there's no, there's no suggestion that they're going to counterattack. I mean, that is the Allies' fear, but that, there's no suggestion at all that the Germans are going to do this. So that being so, there's nothing to stop them from just going straight to the Pisa Rimini line. They've, they've lost the most important bit of ground in southern Italy. It's, it's a complete waste of time. And you know, they are just putting more and more units, good units, after bad. I mean, it, you know, when when Montgomery and Eighth Army finally crossed the Sangro. In late November 1943, the 65th Infantry Division, a German infantry division, is completely destroyed. And, and they're just constantly plugging it in with more units. And, and to plug these units, they're taking units from other divisions. So, you know, the, the Sangro example is an absolute classic. You know, so the 90th, 90th Panzer Grenadier Division gets shoved in. That gets destroyed at Ortona. So then they bring up the 3rd Regiment of the 1st Fauschenjäger Division, which is like a British brigade. So three, three parachute infantry battalions are brought up they're taken from you know so 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 first power division never operates as a division at all you know it's just all over the place you know one unit here another unit there kind of you know there's no unit cohesion or anything like that ever you know all the german commanders are absolutely tearing their hair out so i mean they all think think Kesselring's absolutely awful well, it's incredibly attritional, but up to the point, the, Germ- the Germans are drawing defensive lines, which got me thinking about the Gustav line, because the Gust- once you give something a name, it sounds very uh, static and, and formidable and no doubt to, you know, it, it is formidable. But what what constituted the Gustav line? Are, are we just linking together prominent features or has the tour organisation been in creating Teutonic pillboxes, what constitutes these lines? It's some of the latter, but not that much. So there's not that, there's a bit of concrete, but not so much concrete. It's mainly it's mainly using the landscape, which is absolutely formidable. Uh, and in the case of the, of the the winter line, the Bernhard line, and the Gustav line, it's like think of it as like a sort of double lock system on a kind of safe or something. So you you basically got, you got four main roads that lead to Rome: one on the Tyrrhenian coast on the western side, 
But that's not a very good line for advancement because for an army to advance because it gets very, very narrow, the sort of mountains overhanging the sea and all the rest of it. So again, from an allied point of view moving forward, it's, it's not much room for maneuver. Then you've got the Adriatic coast, which is which is sort of easier to maneuver, but you've still got to get across the leg to get to Rome. Then you've got another one which is really in the mountains and is very difficult in the middle through the sort of Abruzzi mountains and so on. And then you've got the main road north from Naples to, to Rome, which is the Via Casalina, the ancient Roman road, Highway 6. This this goes up a, a quite a wide valley from Naples and then goes through the Mignano Gap, which is quite narrow, and then goes up into the Liri Valley, which is quite wide again, and, and is quite a clear run up, up up to Rome. And that's that's the easiest route if if all other factors were taken out. But from the from the Bernhard line point of view, it, the Mignano Gap is this sort of narrow bit where the road and railway line pass through a series of mountains, but the two big mountains either side are Monte Camino and Monte Samucro, both about 3,000 feet high. And you simply can't pass through that until you've got those peaks as attacking from an attacking point of view. And the reason you can't do that is because up on the top are German observers looking down, and they've got every bit of that ground covered. And they've also got it zeroed by artillery. And what I mean by zeroing is is they've already predetermined where they're going to be firing and where their shells are going to be landing. So you just go fire on X2 and it will, you know, a whole load of shells will pummel that particular stretch of the road. So there is just no way a mechanised army can go through it while while guns are trained on it, you know, field guns. Think of the guns of Navarone. It's the same principle. You can't get any ships past there until you've taken out that gun on the cliff. So it's, it's basically the same principle as that, although it be on land rather than at sea. So it, it makes it an incredibly formidable position. And, and what, what they're meaning by, by, by a, a defensive line is on the low ground, lots of wire and mines and all the rest of it, lots of observers on the top, pre-recorded artillery positions, bunkers on the reverse slopes, so dug into the side of the mountains, just blasted out with dynamite, you know, log-covered roofs, all this kind of stuff. It's, it, that's what I think. It's not a wall like the Great Wall of China. It's, 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 it's a series of, of interconnected firing points and defensive positions. That's basically it. Which almost starts to sound very First World War-like. Um, you make a point in the book, which I hadn't realised, it's 50,000 Air Force personnel at those Fodger airfields. It's just absolutely huge commitment. Huge commitment. Huge commitment. There is this incredible thing where, where by the 25th of November 1943, American engineers have built a pipeline from the coast to Foggia which can take 160,000 gallons of high octane fuel every single day. I mean, it's it's incredible, but but just think of the price of that, you know, because that shipping space, that logistics capability is competing with the guys who are trying to kind of battle their way up Monte Samucro and Monte Camino and the Mignano Gap, for example. But can that air force was the air force used as a as, as a tactical air force rather than a strategic air force with such a, No, it's a strategic but air. But can they not strategic. did they not use it as a tactic why did they not use it as a t- well they did subsequently <laughs> yes they used it and then flattened monte casino and then uh, casino town in february and, and then subsequently march 1944 so so yes but that's not its job its job is to go and destroy supply lines in the brenner pass and and to hit aircraft factories in wiener neustadt and elsewhere and you know that's and, and hit ploesti which is in romania and which is the only source of real oil that the that the germans have and so consequently you know you add all this you add, add from an ally point of view you add into the mix a shortage of supplies which means a shortage of replacements, shortage of troops, you know, shortage of ammunition, shortage of, of everything. It's still more than the Germans have, but it's but it's not kind of the level you would expect Allied forces to have, which means there's a tougher burden on the infantry because it's winter and miserable, and because the Germans are up in the mountains. You've got to get, you've got to, you are now embracing mountain warfare, and and there is no solution to that other than using mules and and their own two feet of the infantrymen. And up on the mountains, you know, where the soil is incredibly thin and where it's basically stone, the the effect of any blast, whether it be a, an artillery shell or whether it be a mortar, is obviously exaggerated because the shrapnel's got nowhere to go. You know, on the sands of Dunkirk, the shell's absorbed by the soft sand. On the top of Monte Smucro, it isn't. And in addition to that, it's made worse by the shards of of, of rock, which are being splintered as a result of the of, of the blast. So it's it's doubly lethal and doubly awful, and it's cold, and it's winter, and it's pouring with rain. Um, and, and on the low bit, it's just a quagmire of mud, because all these roads in Italy, you know, they're 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 Strada Bianca, they you know, these dirt roads, and they're designed for 
the odd little Alfa Romeo futting along um, and a kind of, you know, and a mule and a card, but not 3,000 vehicles per, per division, you know, all of which are of, of the heavier rather than the lighter variety. So you can see how it all goes pear-shaped pretty quickly. I mean, you know, it, it, I, for me, it's a miracle that the Allies get as far as they do by the end of December 1943. By Christmas. Well, I, what struck me at the end was how, you know, I couldn't keep, keep coming back to that First World War. There's always in the mind of the British commanders not wanting to rerun the First World War and mass slaughter. And that's kind of, you've got MUDs, you've got huge artillery attacks, you've got, that's why I was thinking, well, why did they use this? The, the one ace up their sleeve is this huge air force that they could perhaps use to their advantage because it, it's such a slog. Well, one of the big problems is, 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 that, is that, you know, they get to Foggia and they, and they start trying, you know, 15th Air Force is formed on the 1st of November 1943. They first start getting there from you know start moving from north africa at the end of end of november and first operations are sort of you know second week of i think december 1943 problem is is the ground is an absolute quagmire it's beautifully flat it's fantastic in summer but 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 it's waterlogged and you know 10 times cloud you know it's, it's waterlogged on the ground and it's very difficult bombing conditions because there's so much cloud about so actually 15th air force what it what it what it can do and what it can achieve is is pretty limited to be perfectly yeah, honest. Yeah, well that that's got us to Christmas. So I was going to ask you about because you make a point in your book which I thought was really fascinating about how you rely on contemporary sources rather than interviews, and then I wondered how that shaped if if that shaped your research different differently because it's very odd talking getting interviews I, they sort of fall out. Not how you expect always. Yeah, well, I was really lucky. I mean, you know, back in the day, I was hoovering up in the interviews with veterans, and it was just, you know, it was an amazing privilege and fascinating and all the rest of it. But actually, it was when I was, I did a book on the Sherwood Rangers on a sort of single tank tank regiment, and I, I used a lot of diaries and, and letters then, and I was really, really struck by the immediacy of these, particularly when they were well well written. You know, it led to a slight sort of officer bias, I suppose rather than the other ranks because of course you know the officers weren't they they self-censored which often meant that they didn't really censor very much at all i mean you know they didn't put in sort of place names but but you can marry up the letters with the um with the war diaries it's very easy to work out exactly what's going on and suddenly there was a sort of level of detail which i i hadn't really appreciated what they're writing is what they're writing at that moment that evening in their tent or bivouac or whatever you know in in october 1943 or whatever date it is. And you've got this incredible immediacy. And also the other thing is, is you know, interviewing people sort of 60, 70 years, 80, 80 years after the event. Obviously, memory is incredibly fickle. And, and you can't, you just simply can't remember. You, you can remember um, certain events with, with enormous detail, but you can't remember times of day and dates and and the kind of sort of forensic detail you get from, a, from, from looking at diaries and letters. And... The other thing is, is what what you care about on a particular given moment is not necessarily what you remember caring about sixty years later. So all these things sort of led me to think, well, no, I'm going to try and make this contemporary. I'm going to try and do no forward projection whatsoever. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of, you know, I can pass judgment on things that are happening in the moment, but I'm not going to pass judgment on, you know, with my retrospective hat on. You know, so you're reading a diary, and and you know, in October, and one of the guys is sort of going, "God, you know, I don't think we'll even get to Rome by Christmas at this rate." And you, you know, you you just say, "Want to go, mate? You're not going to be there till June." Oh well, yeah, but of course, he doesn't know that, and isn't that interesting? The other thing is, I think think their characters just really, really just burst off every page, and so you get this very, very clear kind of picture of who these characters are, what they were like, what their likes are what they grumble about, what bothers them, what concerns them, and so on. And and they just come alive. You know, that that is the truth of it. You know, the, the, you're, you're putting flesh back onto onto bones which have, have, have long since gone underground. And it's just incredibly fascinating, that sort of contemporary perspective. And I've always used diaries in the past, but I haven't used them religiously. And what I'm trying to do now is use diaries and letters, contemporary sources, primarily rather than occasionally and uh it just you know it's just transformed the way i write it really well i think it's interesting because it, when you read the contemporary sources they fit themselves into the war as they see it at that moment whereas if you get the interview often they you know my father i think finished the war and had no idea quite what had happened and it was only when 
uh, you know, got Horrocks, you know, he, 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 on telling you what had happened, that he starts to fit himself into the war. So when you talk to him about the war, he's going, well, of course we did this. My dad had no idea what, what he was doing during the war. He just had to go from A to B. And, you know, and afterwards I pulled his war diary the war diaries for his unit, asked him to write down what he thought and put the two together. Well, they were completely different. And then when I'm saying to him, you know, when you were driving to wherever it was, this was in uh, support of Operation Veritable. He's going, what's that then? I thought the, that's why you were driving all the ammunition up. They were getting ready for it. Oh, was it? Yeah. And you know, when you went on leave to to Paris, yeah, that's when Operation Veritable started. Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. That, that's it. That's what's rather my point, really. Um, so anyway, so, you know, I'm going to continue in that vein, I think. Because the other, the other thing that really amused me, which I'd not heard before, um, you referred to medics as Zambux, which is great because my dad used to waff, waffle on about Zambuk being some miracle cure for absolutely everything. And I don't think anybody knew what it was until somebody somewhere brought home a tin of Zambuk cream, I think, from Africa. I'm not even sure. Is it an antiseptic cream? I'm not even sure yeah, quite what so, it yeah. was. Yeah, I think so. Or gentian violet or something. Zambux. Brilliant yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. And you get all that. You get all that lovely lingo that you get from from, from, from the period. It's, um, yeah, I think it's great. Well, James, thank you for your time. Uh, loyal listener, if you want more from James, you can find him on the We Have Ways podcast. And if you want to know more about Italy in 1943, his book is The Savage Storm. Now, if you are interested in ad-free listening to the podcast, why not become a patron of the show? You can find details at patreon.com slash WW2podcast. I'm an independent historian and it is those contributions from listeners like you that allow me to find the time to put the show together. So that's patreon.com slash WW2podcast. Hopefully, in the next episode, we'll be looking at U-boat hunting. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Eighty-eight millimeter gun hit our tank, blew us the hell out of it. 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 Darling, that can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.